high percentage of African American Californians, even those who voted more liberally on other issues, did in fact support Proposition 8. And the exit polls uh, showed how many racial minorities really do resent having their particular struggle uh, compared to sexual orientation. Uh, in, in this article, both Meacham and Miller made two serious mistakes uh, in that vein. The first was stating as a proven fact the notion that sexual orientation is unchangeable. And as you said, uh, sexual orientation is a very smoky concept. It is uh, somewhat difficult to verify. It's a relatively new concept even, but much more important is the notion that, as uh, Meacham said, and I'm quoting here, the Judeo-Christian religious case for supporting gay marriage begins with the recognition that sexual orientation is not a choice. In other words, he says, there is a religious argument to be made that if you have a set of feelings that are permanent and deeply ingrained, they are thereby justified. And as you said, there are many different feelings that most of us would abhor, pedophilia or violence or, or different uh, emotional problems that we would never suggest that they are legitimate just because they may be unchangeable. Lisa Miller, who writes the article, uh, she actually spends a lot of time talking about how uh, the patriarchs like uh, Abraham were polygamists, the kings were uh, polygamists, and then uh, she makes the point that neither Jesus nor the Bible define marriage as between one man and one woman, and she says no sensible person wants marriage, theirs or anyone else's, to look in its particulars anything like what the Bible describes. So here you have, on the one hand, the Bible being positioned as full of polygamy. No one really wants their marriage to look like what you find in the Bible. And, oh, by the way, the Bible never defines marriage as between one man and one woman. What do you say? Well, uh, for someone who is writing so extensively about religion, I am surprised she missed what Jesus said about God's intention when he was asked about marriage, and he went back to the creation account and said, Don't you know that from the beginning God made the male and female? For this cause a man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife. They shall become one flesh, what God is joined together, let no one set asunder. That's a pretty clear statement of standard and definition of marriage. Uh, no reasonable person would read the Old Testament and say that its description of patriarch's character or behavior was an endorsement of that behavior. Uh, in fact, Jesus made it clear that, that the fact that many people did have a number of wives or engaged in any any number of uh, uh, behaviors outside of God's standards were in fact wrong. So uh, again, I, I think that she's missed the obvious, whether deliberately or accidentally. And, and, and this is a key point that you bring out, Joe. You have the difference between that which is descriptive and that which is prescriptive. In other words, uh, the Bible is very, very clear about the warts and moles and wrinkles of all the patriarchs. It doesn't airbrush them. But on the other hand, in terms of a prescription, it tells us in Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, you must not multiply wise. I don't know how it gets any more clear than that. <laughs> and in fact, we read that much of the heartache that many of our patriarchs had, David in particular, by the way, and certainly Solomon, had to do with violating that commandment. But, you know, Hank, also, if we look at the general tenor of Scripture, I see marriage as being afforded the highest possible honor when it is used as a type and a symbol of God's relationship to his people. And that alone tells me that the Bible actually views marriage in a very positive light. The fact that Paul told husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church tells me that Paul had, in fact, a very high regard for marriage and for the married state. So 
where she got the notion that neither Jesus nor Paul thought much of marriage, I can't imagine. Here's another thing that you brought up in the, in the article uh, by Lisa Miller. She says, we no longer heed the Bible on haircuts or blood sacrifices, so why should we heed its condemnations of homosexuality? And Meacham makes the same point. And it's from the editor's desk. He says scriptural passages that condemn homosexuality with equal ferocity forbid particular haircuts. So we now can cut our hair like we want. So why can't a man have sex with another man or marry another man or a woman for that matter? You know, Hank, it it is difficult for me to believe that uh, both Meacham and Miller really believe those arguments themselves. I'm sure they're both aware that the chapters in Leviticus, Leviticus 18 and 20, that condemn homosexuality also condemn incest in virtually every form and bestiality and adultery. Now, I don't hear anybody arguing that bestiality, adultery, or incest could be legitimized just because they appear in the Old Testament. It's clear to anyone who has read those chapters that the behaviors that are prohibited in those chapters are prohibited elsewhere in Scripture as well. There are universal, if you want to put it that way, commandments and prohibitions in the Old Testament that clearly are not culturally uh, limited. And uh, as I said, it's hard for me to believe that both Miller and Meacham don't know that. Yeah, I, I think, just as you say, the issue here is so basic that it's amazing that an editor-in-chief of a major magazine written to people living in an age of enlightenment could possibly be confused. I mean, priests in a theocratic context were set apart through civil and ceremonial practices in that they were a type of the quintessential high priest, Jesus Christ, who as a sacrificial lamb was the ultimate mediator between God and man. And that's a far cry from moral laws that are as efficacious for us today as they were for ancient Israel. But look, Meacham also wants to say this. He wants to say that Christians have long cited scriptural authority to justify and perpetuate slavery, and he provides no corrective whatsoever to Lisa Miller when she makes the contention that the Bible endorses slavery. So again, this is all a means by which you ultimately uh, try to crack a person's legitimate focus on the Scripture as a final authority. Yes, and, and suppose, Hank, you and I were having an argument, and I began the argument by saying, Hank... I already know that you're going to object to everything I say, and I already know that your objections are not valid, therefore I dismiss them in advance, and then I make my case. That is, in essence, what Meacham did when he said in his editorial preceding Miller's article that the prediction to this story uh, is easy to make and that conservative Christians will object, and he said, in essence, go ahead, let the letters and the emails come. So he began his argument by, in essence, dismissing any objections to it. Well, let's make this point as clear as we can, Joe. Uh, the average Christian, and this is really the problem, the problem is not that pagans are going to exercise their job description and be pagans. The problem is that Christians oftentimes can't discern between truth and an error, and they read this kind of thing, and a lot of times it does shake their confidence in the Bible. In fact, I've been talking to a lot of young kids who read these kinds of things and immediately think, you know what, maybe the Bible shouldn't be my authority, maybe it should give me a few principles here and there, but leave it at that. Well, you know, Hank, uh, in my work I deal almost every day with Christian people who are not sure whether or not it's legitimate to have sexual relations before marriage, some of whom are not sure whether or not homosexuality is biblically condemned, and invariably they tell me that they're not hearing these things taught in their churches. Now, I look at the work of CRI, and I have to ask myself if, in fact, the majority of churches we're taking seriously the admonishment to study, to show yourself approved unto God, 
how much of your work would be necessary? How much of my work would be necessary? I think if we were well equipped in Scripture, if we were taught expository, verse by verse, Bible teaching, I think we'd be much better able to discern truth from error. So I, I don't think this needs to be a complicated issue. We don't have to be experts on psychology or human sexuality, but I do think we need to know what the Word says about itself, about God, and about human nature. And I think equipped with that, we can have a very intelligent dialogue. We are, in fact, underscoring in red the fact that truth is under siege. Well, when truth is under siege, we want to make sure that we can competently communicate truth. We want to be able to give answers to the kinds of questions that people are asking. And this is not just something for Joe Dallas or Hank Hanegraaff or a hired gun somewhere. This is the job of every single believer. You have people within your sphere of influence that are being shaken by these kinds of articles, 